appreciate it. All right, the meeting will come to order at 6.34 p.m. We'll start with roll call and I can go first. I'm Melanie Dobson. It's my first night as chair of our library advisory board. Jane, why don't you go next? Can she hear? I don't know. Oh, did you say my name? Yes. Go ahead and introduce okay. yourself. Hi, I'm sending you greetings from Honolulu. <laughs> Very nice. Go ahead, just um, spout out your name and um, your position. Oh, my name, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm out of it. Excuse me, my name is Jane Van Curen and I am position five. And you want me to spell my name? No, no. <laughs> I, okay, I, I can tell you my birth date. <laughs> <laughs> Any more information? All right, everybody else can introduce themselves. I can't see everybody that's online. Okay, I'll go next. I'm Fritz Kalaszewski. I'm position four, rural representative. And Steve, are you here? Yeah, Steve Remsen, um, board member. Not sure what number I am, but uh, I'm here with bells on. Happy to join you all this evening. All right, thank you for being here. And then Adrian, do we also have the, the staff introduce yourselves typically, or is it just the board members? Uh, we do, but Lily is here as well, and Mandy is here as well. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't see everybody. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Lily and I'm the high school representative. All right, and Randy? Hi. And I'm Randy Mifflin. I think I'm position number two here on the board. Fantastic. And I'll introduce myself. I'm Adrian Doman Culkins, library manager, and I'll pass it to Crystal. I'm Crystal Garcia, adult services librarian. All right, fantastic. Thank you, everybody. And I don't believe we have any guests today, do we, Adrian? No, no guests. Okay. Um, oh, here comes Danny, actually. Oh, good. Not as a guest, but as a member. All right. I can just place there. Let's see, I saw, oh, there you are. Hi, Danny. Hi, hey, Danny, we're doing introductions. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. She's on mute. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm late. My Microsoft Teams was acting up. Um, I'm not quite sure what I was doing wrong. I don't think you did anything wrong. Mine didn't work either. So. <laughs> Um, so I'm Danny Sticka, and I live here in Sherwood. And I think that's—is there anything else? No, nope, that's fantastic. Thank okay. you so much. All right. Does anybody have any changes to the agenda this evening? Nope. Oh, all right. If not, we'll go ahead and move on. All right. Um, do we have any changes to the meetings from last meeting? And I'll say, you know, the, in the minutes, I don't always do this when the facts change after a meeting and the minutes are really a record of that time. But I did add a couple little notes. I'm sure you saw, like, that's no longer true. We're not doing in-person events. I just didn't want the wrong information to get out there. So um, if you attended the meeting and then were wondering why I did that, you know, I don't always correct minutes, but. I did see that. Thank, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? I move we approve the minutes as provided. All right, and then do we have a second? Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, great, and is anybody against that? All right, then we can go ahead and move along. Adrian, I think you're next. Did, did I get, did I cover everything? Yes, I think you're doing great, Madam Chair. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yay. Right, so I'm gonna scroll down. So I have kind of a, a cornucopia of updates here. Um, want to mention we have two vacancies on the Library Advisory Board. So as you saw in email, Vish Seti, Vishwa Seti um, has moved out of Sherwood, and so his position is open. And then we still had another vacancy on it that we had not been able to fill. And so the <laughs> notice for that has been updated and everything, you know, hoping to get applications and interest. Um, 
haven't gotten any yet, but wanted to let you know that we're working on that. Um, we also have two vacancies actually for staff on the on the library staff. Our page just left for a job at um, Washington County Library, Washington, excuse me, West Slope Library, which is run by Washington County. And so that position is posted. So that's Jade. She just left. She was great with us for about three years, three and a half years. And then um, we had a library assistant two position that's been vacant for a little while. We postponed posting that while we focus on filling the page position. The page position is entry levels for shelving. And, and uh, it's like the, if you don't have carts and you don't have them being shelved, you know, everybody obviously is helping, but that's why we're doing that one first because otherwise we put the whole thing grinds to a halt. Um, so that was that update. And then pandemic changes, I think, I think I shared some of this, but just to reiterate, you know, we had been planning to have in-person programming outside story time starting this month. We had been planning on bringing back some of our book clubs um, in September and October. And we, with the Delta variant and things getting um, just in plans changing in the county, there was a really strong message coming from Board of Commissioners and would really do our part to um, not have any in-person events where we could. And so um, so that's on pause. Everything's still virtual. Um, and then let's see, this meeting continued virtually. That was in the minutes before, you know, that we had been planning on going um, in person. I don't have a date for when they'll go in person. So, you know, I would think that we'll be through the fall and part of the winter virtually would be my guess, um, but I, I don't really know. When that came to us as moving to in-person, that was a city decision, that wasn't my decision. Um, let's see, and then programming and services. I want to mention some of what's going on right now. So September is library card sign up month and their um, prizes, you know, from the county that they're doing if somebody comes and gets a new library card and they can get a little tote bag and um, and people who already have a tote, or excuse me, already have a library card can follow the county WCCLS on social media and have a chance to win a tote bag. I don't know, I think, uh, um, I think Danny, can I put you in the spot? I think we saw your question, right? Like the tote bags are really cute. And uh, some people were asking me, how can I get a tote bag? <laughs> and uh, um, I have to just hope that you win one, basically. I don't know if we'll have any leftover, if we'll have any any say in what happens with those. Um, but they're making a big deal about it. WCCLS has done some rebranding and they're really trying to put a positive spin on um, library card sign up month. They haven't always gotten involved in that one. Um, Band Books Week is coming up at the end of the month. We'll have a big display about that. And this year we're offering the, um, there's this booklet that normally we buy in printed form only. It's printed nationally and we put it out. So all the books that were banned somewhere in America um, the previous year are printed up in this book. And so this year we're providing that digitally as well as some printed copies. And that went out in our e-newsletter and we're getting a lot of interest in that. So that's that's an interesting, um, you know, just virtual way of doing it. Um, Let's see, we did put a pause on our in-person tech help appointments. We had just started those back up again. We're still doing computers open in the library, but for tech help, we're trying to do, you know, if it's if it's 15 minutes or less, we don't need an appointment. We don't need to call it a tech help appointment, but um, for a sit down one-on-one -on -one, closer than six feet, you know, helping someone for 30 minutes at a time, just, this is not the time to be doing a lot of that. Um, let's see, I think that's what I wanted to say about that. Well, just, is, is my audio sounding okay? There's a lot of background noise here with people working on something on the wall over there. <laughs> no. Yes. Okay. So we're not fine. picking up at all. You sound great. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. My dad and my son are working on the plumbing. <laughs> 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 I didn't expect that to be so loud. Uh, let's see, summer reading highlights. So we have adult summer reading and the youth summer reading, right? And um, I'm putting it down. Numbers, make sure. 
say the right thing. So adult summer readings gave away 475 books and we received 303 book reviews. We've got a lot of really good readers. And then the youth summer reading, we gave away 2,500 books. Um, and that was both for the, the first set combined with the finishers also get a second book. Um, so, and there were lots of other activities and things, of course, going on as well. The summer reading highlights for the youth side, we had a lot of outdoor events, which was really fun to see people in person. We had um, those Tuesday at two performances, and then we had the bilingual story time in the park also. And then right as that was finishing, we were hoping to do the story times in person, but of course had to stop that. Um, we really take a break from talking. Does anybody have any questions about anything I've said so far? Um, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, first of all, how how did the social justice virtual camp go? Was there any uh, positive or negative from the community? Uh, there was a lot of positive. It was nothing negative other than what I shared last time. Yeah. Okay. So, nothing new. Then. Yeah. Yeah, no news is good news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had wonderful comments of people who participated. Um, uh, really high quality, you know, we hope to do something again like it. And uh, um, yeah, just lots of really good feel good stories about it. Good participation, good discussions. And then my second question is now that school is back in session, is there tutoring in the library? Um, so, so tutoring in the library pre-pandemic, we had we hadn't been doing it for a while. It had really petered out for popularity and the volunteer interest and student family interest. We had, I think, maybe a year before the pandemic, we had one last kiddo that was still interested, and and we ended up sort of phasing out that program because it was. You know, the, there was just so little interest in for the amount of time it took for staff and everything to, to promote and all that. We do have tutoring, as, well, not really tutoring, but homework help available online that is live that's uh, through a service that WC Salas provides. Um, if somebody is wanting to use our space for tutoring, you know, that used to happen a lot. They can yeah. do that still. I think um, anecdotally, I don't think I've seen that. I mean, they would have to wear masks and, um, but there are no longer restrictions on how long a person stays, you know, the furniture, furniture is accessible again. So there's not any reason why someone couldn't do it, but I don't know. Crystal, I wonder, are you noticing any tutoring happening? Um, I'd say earlier in the summer, maybe mid-summer, there was some. I don't know. It might have been the tail end of the school year. Um, we did have one group that would come in for maybe an hour or so at a time, um, but I haven't seen them recently. Whoops. I muted myself. For a second. I think that's good to know. Thank you, Crystal. And I think even pre-pandemic, if I think about when we had the tutoring program, it would pick up after school had been in session for, I don't know, like a month and a half or so as people got kind of loaded down with homework and tests and knew what, how they were doing and mm -hmm. where they needed help. Yeah, so maybe that will change. No? Okay. Any other questions so far? Okay, so... Uh, next on the list was the ALA Library Transforming Communities Grant, and so that's the one that's understanding race that um, we just started putting books out in September. So Crystal is leading on the adult side of that, and Jamie Thorson is leading on the youth side of that. I'll, I'll actually show you where that is on the website here just a moment, too. Um, so we're getting tons of positive feedback about that. That's the one that's... Um, um, it's also funded by ALA and Rotary is helping as well. If you come to our website and you see the community reads Understanding Race, you know, many ways to participate. The books are while supplies last, but it looks like, I mean, they're going quickly, but we still have supplies. It's optional to join our book discussion. The youth title is here. 
And so that is, this book is anti-racist. I don't know how to pronounce the, the um, illustrator's name. Let's see, by Tiffany Jewell Illustrated. I'm not gonna try, I'll mess it up. Um, and then they have a complimentary journal that goes with it. And so the, the idea is that the person can be, you know, pick up the book, read it in advance, and then optionally attend either the October 12th or the October 26th date. We have a lot of strong interest in that one already. And then I'll go back to the adult one. Crystal, do you want to talk up the adult one or do you want me to just keep going? I you feel can like keep it's... going, Adrian. It's yeah. the same, okay. same model as the youth one. Yeah, yeah. okay. So Crystal put a lot of time and effort into this, you know, so the adult title, so you want to talk about, about race. Um, and there's not a journal that's published to go with this, but there's a, Crystal picked out a blank journal so that people can be writing as they're reading. And then again, there are two optional um, library facilitated discussions, October 14th or October 28th. So plenty of time to get the book and read along with us. It's our first community reads. We're um, doing it. I see your hand, Jane. Just one moment. Um, we're we're promoting it, but we're not promoting it in like a, the biggest way either, because we want it to be. Um, you know, we want people who are already interested in this topic to come. We don't want it to be divisive. And so just about everywhere where we're talking about it, we also have a statement about how we're doing this from a point of empathy and not getting into politics, just like we did with the social justice story time. Jean, do you have a question? Yes, it's it's fast. At first, I didn't understand uh, why someone could get the book for a child or for an adult without registering for this for the seminars and discussions. And now I get it. I, I think that uh, that was a good call. Uh, on the part of the library staff because it makes it more open. And then if people do choose to sign up for these discussion activities on those four days in October, I think it's great. I, I, I get what you're thinking on this now. No, thank you. And so we didn't invent that model. That's a, you know, a common community reads model too where you just you get as many copies of the book or books as you can you get them out there get people excited and reading them and then you know there's always just a subset of of any group reading a book that actually wants to or even can attend a, um, a synchronous I session think it's wonderful. Um, thank you fritz did you have a question or comment i thought i saw no something no okay Okay, good. So we're getting lots of positive feedback so far about those choices for the books. Um, let's see, next on the list was strategic focusing updates. I just want to keep this on the agenda every time. And so not a ton of changes since we kind of, you know, we, where we were last time, we spent a lot of time talking about this piece down here about restoring in-person programs. And then of course we had to pause on that. So um, that's really where we were at. We had, we did restore test proctoring. I don't believe we've had any actual tests proctored yet. We had some interest, but they weren't actual um, tests that were qualified for our style of proctoring, but it's not in a private room with an attendant. Um, we had restored one-on-one -on -one tech help briefly, and then we, and did it, you know, so um, it's kind of where we're at with things here. Um, the survey, which I'll speak about in a little while, that is done. And so I'll share the results from that. We haven't dug into census data yet. Um, this whole equity column, um, the, so this wasn't really a library thing, and I wouldn't call it deeper training, but the city did, for the first time to my knowledge, the city provided an EDI training to all city staff, and that happened um, over the course of a few weeks. And so everybody's gone through that. That was more of a, I, I would call it an introduction. I think it was about an hour and a quarter. And so 
um, I think it's useful if people haven't, if they need a refresher or if they haven't done this sort of training before. I think for our staff, we've done quite a bit more and we still need to do kind of, you know, the next layers. Um, and I'm working on onboarding. I'm working on my schedules and getting the onboarding going. Um, okay, I'm gonna come pop back over here for WC Salas updates. I wanted to mention if you haven't noticed already with the WCCLS rebranding, they redid the website WCCLS.org. And so that looks a little bit different these days. Um, all the content is still there. They've changed the logo slightly, they've changed the colors slightly, and still do your catalog search right up at the top. Um, they have a new blog that you can read. If you're not already signed up for their e-newsletter, you can do that as well. Here's those book uh, bags that we were talking about. And then I wanted to point out, I this is my favorite link here. It's buried half, almost towards the bottom. I mean, this is the best way, in my opinion, to get to the catalog if you want to browse. So if you like going into a library and browsing book displays or a bookstore and browsing the displays and the suggestions from staff and so on, this is like that that front entry, you know, where you start to see all the lists. If you go just do your catalog search, it takes until you've done a search and you start to see the search results and then back out of it before you see all of this. So and I just I take an opportunity to show that. I want um, can I say something? Adrian, yeah, uh, I want to make a comment on when you go up there um, to explore mm -hmm. up there, and then you have de going down to awards. Yes. Yeah, and that um, all the awards, you know, all the book awards that there are with a description of all of them. If you go to that little thing that says all awards, that little browse all awards, that to me is absolutely terrific. Mm. It has it has every kind of award there is, you know, all the various literary awards and mysteries and, you know, historical and biographies and everything. And then it, when, you, when you click on it, it describes the award. And then you can look at all the award, you know, the Pulitzer, the Nobel or any of those. Mm -hmm. So I just I, I love that link. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. That's great. I just picked the James Beard. I, I select cookbooks. <laughs> so I was like, oh, let's see. And, and some of you might not have had dinner yet. Let's yeah. see what the award winners are for the cookbooks. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Fritz. Um, let's see. I'll just go back here. Well, I, there are a few other things I wanted to mention about WC Celeste. Um, so you heard me speak about the cooperative agreement process or CAP, and I think it was the last meeting I gave them a tour of where to find those documents. The CAP process has stalled a bit. Um, so there's still work being done to update the service area maps. Each library has their own service area. Um, that I thought I would have results of that by now, but we don't yet. And then the last two CAP meetings were postponed. Um, the reason for that is largely because the, um, the governance model of how WCCLS fits into the larger county is uh, the, the style is a little bit different with the current board of commissioners. And so, so topics about our CAP um, meetings is going to board of commissioners for work sessions before earlier in the process than it would have with the previous board of commissioners. Um, so that's all good. They're taking a really strong interest. They're very pro-library, um, but it, it's just changing the timeline. And I, that meeting, I think, um, the meeting got, one of the meetings got postponed and I think, you know what, I feel like maybe one of them was yesterday, but I didn't see anything about it yet. It, maybe it's next Tuesday. Um, so I'll know more after I see that. And then the, let me just think about this for a second. So the, the board of commissioners, you know, they're the, they approve the county budget, they approve their for the WC Celeste budget, and they approve the distribution of WC Celeste funds to member libraries. And then at the 
at the member library level, we have each member library has a rep and a policy group, which I'm on, and executive board, which our senior, or excuse me, our city manager is on. And the executive board um, acts as an advisory group to WCCLS and ultimately to the board of commissioners. And so um, executive board doesn't actually make those final decisions, just like you're an advisory board. Um, the executive board doesn't actually make the final decisions about the funding distribution. They make a recommendation. Um, but because the board of commissioners has that final vote, they wanted to understand the full process more. There's a lot of new membership there. So I wanted you to know that. I don't know if any of you are following the cap process or, you know, really interested, but for anybody that's watching who's interested in the cooperative agreement process, that's the update. All right, I'm going to go back to the agenda. Let's see, I think that's all I had there for regular updates. I feel like I went back faster than I thought I would. Any other questions or comments? Okay. All right, do we move next to the user survey results? Yes. Let's make it my, so I'm going to stop sharing this, make it my document up here. One moment. Okay, so I'm putting up on the screen, um, it's just a, a PDF. I will share this with this document with you so that you have it. Um, as a reminder, we had put out the survey via SurveyMonkey and we got bombarded with hundreds of um, participants within days. And it was very clear that, um, you know, most of them were not like it. we got spammed that most of those were not actual real um, library patrons and so we paused and then put it out again a few weeks later it was, actually went out in july instead of um may and june it also um ended up being there were some questions about how it may or may not have related to the budget sessions that were going on which was not our intention, we're just trying to lay the groundwork for strategic planning. Um, typically, we had been doing a user survey every two years, but the last one that we did was in 2017 for a variety of reasons. So let me just scroll down. So we got 102 responses. Back in 2017, we had 546. So definitely fewer. I just, for prosperity's sake, I put this note in here about the pandemic still going on during the survey in case anybody's like, what's going on? <laughs> That's what that is. We added this new zip code to try and disqualify people who weren't actually in the area. So, so 97140, of course, is the Sherwood zip code. These are all adjacent to Sherwood, and I and um, I would consider them legitimate Sherwood patrons. You know, we want to know their opinion, too. They all got to participate in the survey. Anybody who said other or I don't know then was politely told, you know, you don't qualify to take the, the survey. And so most people were in the 97140, which covers all of Sherwood and rural Sherwood. And then this is a question used to be at the end, and this is a, um, excuse me, a survey monkey question. And so this, how likely is it that you would recommend Sherwood Public Library to a friend or colleague? We're up five points since last time. We were at 69 last time. The respondents answer on a scale of zero to 10. And then the 2017 results I have in this box here below. So the way SurveyMonkey does it, they say detractors scored a zero to six, passives 
you know, kind of give you a medium grade, a seven to eight, the promoters a nine to 10. Um, so we were at 78% promoters. Last time we were at 74.5% promoters. Um, our detractors went down a little bit as well. I think it's hard to say how statistically significant anything in the survey is, but I, I think um, because there's only 101 people, there were people who were probably using the library um, during times when it was really difficult to use the library. We didn't get as many of our, our less frequent patrons. But on the other hand, it's feedback from real life people who live in Sherwood or near Sherwood and use a library and care about giving us feedback. So it's not the only data, you know, this whole survey, I mean, it's not the only data we use to make decisions, but it adds richness to the data that we have. Uh, question three was, if there was one thing we could do, what would it be? And uh, there wasn't any, you know, one thing that really rose to the top. I. I kind of condensed these. There were lots of people that said, we love the library. Lots of people who said, like, you're doing a good job. Just keep it up. So that's why this is on here and good. And then a lot of people said more books, which we're used to seeing. Um, these other slightly smaller ones only represented a few people. But there were um, but a few for more adult events and more bestsellers. So like hunting magazines was one person, community resources was one person. It's hard to read some of this. Um, so some good ideas there. And then what library services did you use during the pandemic? Check all that apply. Most people used curbside holds. Only a few didn't use anything. You might recall you asked me as a group, you asked me some pointed questions like, do we really need to know this? I'm like, yes, I want to know. <laughs> I want to know, did they, you know, did they use the things that they're, that, because later we ask how important is it to still have access to this? And so I thought this was interesting. Um, I thought the eBooks one would be um, even bigger. Uh, book bundles was very popular. We're not doing book bundles right now. We thought maybe we would keep them going, but they petered out um, right around I think it was June or July when things were getting much better with vaccinations and the rates and so on. And then also our window blinds were stuck in a down position and people couldn't see them because there was maintenance and there was electrical problems. So we phased those out. Virtual events also strong. These are graphs from SurveyMonkey here, by the way. Um, Andrea? Yeah. Question. Um, do you feel like, I mean, I'm surprised that eBooks isn't higher than the curbside holds. Do you do you see these numbers that you have? Do you see that with the numbers that you have through the library as well, as far as like books checked out? Uh, yes. When I so later in the meeting, I'll be presenting statistics, and it kind of depends on what month you're looking at. But as soon as people could have access to print books in a real way, not just curbside, but actually coming in too, then our stats flipped. There was a while where it was about equal of ebook and physical books, and then um, and then physical books took off again. I mean, we're we're not quite to pre-pandemic levels yet. Um, so I think it's interesting, you know, people still really overall prefer print, although a lot of people switch to ebooks and it look like are, are keeping with them. This is the same data, just in a table. Um, we asked how important is it for you personally that these new services continue to be offered after the pandemic? Curbside, 20% said it was important or critical. So this this chart, these bar, um, charts here from um, SurveyMonkey, the blue, the light blue in the bottom here is is a critical and this kind of orangey, what I didn't call it, burnt ochre is important. So what I did is I just added up those two like, okay, well, those are really close. What, what would it be if you counted both those together? So 20%. Um, said curbside was either important or critical. 19% said book bundles were either important or critical. 30.4% um, said virtual events were important or critical. Um, so what we've seen curbside, we've kept 
as an option all along. We're just getting like a few a week these days. That might change. The bundles I spoke about already, the virtual events, we still have a really strong following with the virtual events. And our plan is still to do, um, as, as we ease back in eventually to in-person events, to still have some virtual events and see how that goes. Um, this is just in table form. And then we asked customer service is important to us at Sherwood Public Library. How are we doing? And this orange bar is I routinely get service that exceeds my expectations. So that was about 65. And then the light blue, I almost always get the service I expect. And then if you add those two together, that's 98.6% respondents who, who either routinely have their um, have service that exceeds their expectations or almost always get service that they expect. That's up 1.4% from last time. I think that's pretty good given there was a pandemic and we had to do things, you know, in really creative ways with very limited services while wearing masks and being socially distant and, you know, large part of that time we're quarantining things and all that. Um, the ages of household members, that was more for us as staff to get kind of an idea of our audience. And then languages are spoken um, in the home. So of course, English is almost everybody, Spanish. And then other, it was just literally like one person said French, three people said German, and then I don't know how to pronounce this, and then Hindi, Korean, Punjabi, Russian, Tagalog, Ukrainian. So interesting. I mean, it's a really diverse mix of languages. We didn't have anybody actually submit their answers in the Spanish language survey. We had um, we had that in print and online, and um, we had a few people try it. I think it was either three or five, but they got to that zip code question and then didn't submit after that. Um, how many members of your household have a library card? Most of them are two. How has the library made an impact on you, your family, or your household? And this is a question that's specifically written to dovetail into the um, um, the edge assessment, the one that's about public facing technology. And so this is this is comparable with what we've gotten in the past. I think it's a little bit even more on the entertainment side or recreational. So this would also be, you know, reading for enjoyment, uh, the social connection and the education pieces are usually our strong ones. Employment or business is usually lower. I thought maybe this would be higher these days, but I think because we have such limited um, in-person services, and then there were comments that went on this one. So I just pasted this screenshot in. And again, I'll, I'll email this as well. Oh, I just made the pandemic bearable. We asked what changes would make the library more equitable, diverse, and inclusive? And this one was the first time we asked this question. Um, I thought, I think a lot of people misunderstood the question and um, a lot of people actually said none unsure or some version of not applicable or you're doing great or something. Um, so there's some answers in here that just to me don't quite make sense for what the question is, but I tried to just um, kind of summarize the questions and I put them in alphabetical order because <laughs> I needed them to not be random order. Um, so I think there's some really interesting topic or uh, suggestions in here. Um, you know, more people of color, speakers and events that center around inclusivity, diversity and anti-racism, more people of color out at the front desk. Um, more in-person activities about different cultures and languages, more diverse authors and topics. You know, clearly some people like really put thought into their answers. Um, social justice story time and programs. 
removing fines was grieved. So, you know, there's some themes. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how meeting rooms, and I guess, I mean, I think you could make an argument that meeting rooms would be more inclusive or equitable, I suppose. It's just, it wasn't really clarified what the person meant for quiet area. And then we ask a question, and we've been asking a version of, we've been asking this question for, I think, three or four surveys now to help get an idea of what we should be planning for, you know, if we had means to, with no promises about it, of course, but we get complaints that we don't have things like a meeting room or quiet study spaces or a space for teens, or we get complaints about the noisiness, you know, because there's no, um, because the teens are all there after school or something. And so in order to rank all those things, we ask this question. Um, 55% said it was important or critical to have a teen room. 49% said it was important or critical to have quiet study rooms. The maker space came in at 48% and a larger children's area at 41%. Meeting rooms, so separate from smaller study rooms, but a large meeting room, 39%. And the recording studio was 28%. So this would be, I think, helpful for you know, moving forward with a facility master plan and getting more traction with eventually um, rising in priority with the city, hopefully for an expansion and seeking funding and so on. Oh, excuse me, I lost one. The mezzanine was last one. So increasing access to the mezzanine. Right now the mezzanine and traditionally has been available um, Monday through Friday, eight to five. But of course, the library is open on the weekends and later into the evenings. And is there a way we could secure it and make it a library space too? That's that's just a twenty-five percent. Let's see, how am I doing on time? I feel like I should peek over at the agenda real quick. Um, keep got till seven thirty. Yeah. Okay. We're doing. That's right. We had. Um, uh, we were ahead on the other agenda topic. Okay, so, so that's just it in a table. And then how important to, um, are these facility improvements to you? There, were, there was a spot for open text to write any specific ideas. And so I pasted that in 3D printing. Um, maker space would be lovely, you know, different things different comments, meeting space. How do you pay for any of this? Yes, I don't know the answer to that yet. <laughs> I don't raise my taxes for non-library things. This one I think is interesting about, like this person thinks that those things that we were just asking about are not library things. I, I believe that's what they mean. Um, and no, we wouldn't charge user fees really, but. I see those as library things. Okay, and then we've got question 13. Is there a category or type of material you wish was available for checkout? This is helpful for those of us that select materials. There wasn't anything here that was like, oh, wow, I've never thought about that before. <laughs> you know, it was mostly just either specific um, um, types of formats or titles or some comments about library things. Um, so good to see people are excited. Oh, actually, let me put this up and streaming videos there and online magazines. So so streaming videos we have through Canopy. I don't know if this person knows about that or just thinks that those videos aren't the videos that they want. Um, but online magazines, WC Cells has not gone that route. And you may know a lot of libraries do. It's come up a few times and different vendors have it and they're, they are expensive. Um, that is going to be looked at again. Um, I'm not sure the timeline on that, but I know that got brought up at a recent meeting that I was at because Overdrive has recently added the option to for libraries to also have electronic magazines or online magazines. So that might, that might come up. 
Um, we asked about attendance. Most people are a few times a year. We also ask, you know, why? Like, what obstacles are there? And most people, you know, are busy or there are time conflicts. Um, few people not interested in types of events we offer, or they didn't know about the events, or they forgot the pandemic. Um, and some other just really specific feedback. So I think to me that makes sense. And then, oops, excuse me. Question 16, help us prioritize potential future projects. So this would be different than the facility, but if, you know, should we be doing anything different with our, our time and our resources? Uh, story times and languages other than English, 17% said so that was important or critical. In-person homework help, Fritz, to get to your question, 29%. Video conferencing, 19%. Translators at events, 22%. And outreach, um, 35%. So I thought that was interesting. And in the outreach we described as pop-up events in the community and um, um, partnering with other organizations, you know, things that are out of the library. And then that's in table form. I've popped in just a few quotes. What are we doing really well? Staff is always friendly and helpful. Also, I'm amazed at how adaptable and creative they are. I am too. <laughs> um, what are we doing really well? Is we're doing great in managing the craziness of the pandemic. Every time I've been by, everyone has been incredibly helpful and had a smile. Now, I do have these in just list form, and I did take some time to kind of categorize them so it's easier for some staff to analyze. Um, I mean, they really ran the gamut. So collection, access, events, oops, excuse me, this, oh gosh, facility, physical space always looks attractive, staff are very helpful. Um, easy to use in person services, safety stuff, and then a lot of really great comments about staff. It felt good to share this with staff. Uh, love the library. And then I made a category in question 18 is there anything else you'd like to share? I made a category called happy patron. <laughs> There's just so many of these. It's like, good job, everyone. So um, that felt good. And there was some reopening comments about curbside and opening up again. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share? So glad you're open again. Life is one of the things I missed most during the pandemic. And that's where I left off, or that's where I ended. So that was a big tour of it. Um, I'll send this and it will be in the minutes. I'm going to post this on the library website as well. Um, the last two times we had a survey, we had I had shared the results with city council. I think one time was actually a work session or part of a work session, something that was a presentation with I think National Library Week or something like that. And the last time it was just in their packet at one of the meetings. I asked this time if if uh, if I should do that. And I was told, no, no, let's not, because there were concerns that we were asking questions about things that had a budgetary impact when we don't have the budget. And it was becoming kind of a political question. So, so I'm going to... I don't keep this for when it makes sense to insert it into a conversation about the larger budget and what we're doing and all that, rather than like just blindly give it to them without an introduction or in context. Um, Melanie. Yeah, you might answer this in the statistics portion, but I just noticed kind of consistently through there, there was like 29 or 30 um, respondents that didn't answer pretty much all of the questions. Those 29 or 30 respondents, what did they answer or did they just go on and not answer the question? Mm. 
Well, that's a good question. I I noticed that too. I didn't analyze. I don't have this in the statistics part. I'm thinking I kind of spot checked some of them. I think a lot. You know, it's common because we did have prizes like a baffle drawing for people mm. who participated. Okay. It is sometimes common for people to just be like, yeah, 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 just get me to the end, or I don't know, or I don't have time, and I just want to answer the couple easy questions and then get to the end. So that's not unexpected. I don't know if it was the same. Um, we didn't track all of those all the way through. I can go um, in one submission at a time and see all the way down what oh, did they I'm answer. <laughs> a specific question or questions that they were wanting to answer and then they moved on. But it makes sense that they just wanted the prize at the end. I think that could have been it. I think there were some where it was like they answered some and they didn't answer others. Mm -hmm. um, but there were, there were of the ones where people answered, there were a lot of thoughtful comments. So on the other end of the spectrum, we had people who spent a great deal of time thinking about their answers. It's hard to know. I think um, if we had gotten 500 responses, it might have been a similar ratio, you know, of people who skipped. I think I don't have that in my mind, but I can look that up. How many people skipped answers last time? Any other questions about the survey or comments or suggestions? Um, well, my comment first, I don't know how much you deal with NPS score, but above 70 is something really to sort of hang your hat on. So good mm -hmm. job. That's like best in class, world class. So I think the library yeah. should be quite pleased Yay. with that result. <laughs> um, and then one, it, it was interesting for me, for you to note that the um, folks that opted to take the survey in Spanish dropped out when they got to the zip code um, portion. I wonder if we do a redesign in future. I'm, you know, it's quite a ways out, but maybe ask that one towards the end because I know um, when I've seen some national polling, sometimes that personal data has a bias towards certain groups, and so maybe that was one of the reasons they decided not to participate because they didn't want to volunteer that information. Um, and so we might have lost a demographic you'd really would have liked to capture potentially. So if we would have asked that at the end, you would have at least, you know possibly had all their data and didn't determine if we wanted to include it or not based on the statistics. Or I don't know if there's another question we could ask that could help qualify someone as a patron without mm -hmm. asking their personal information. That's really difficult, I know. But just just a thought, because um, I know that, you know, um, that's, you know, a uh, voice of a customer you're really trying to capture, so. Yeah, thank you. It's a good, it's a good thing to consider. I don't know, I mean, I think, Survey Monkey gave some suggestions and they talked about like asking when was the last time you visited, but I figured people would just fake that answer. And then, um, and so zip code seemed like a way to get at it. I wonder yeah. what would have happened. I mean, it might have been if we had just paused the survey like we did with all the same questions and no disqualifier, just having that pause, maybe we wouldn't have gotten spammed again and it would have been a non-issue. I don't know, you know, like if we do this again in a year or two years, I don't, I don't know if I would advocate for another zip code question or not. It was really well, awful being spammed though. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, I mean, if it wasn't, it wasn't like crashing the survey, was it? Because if it was at the end, you could at least exclude and then re-include like the Spanish speaking maybe, or I, I don't know, it's, yeah. it's an interesting challenge. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it wasn't stuff. crashing it, it was yeah. just. You're getting yeah, bad data, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Melanie, is your hand up anew or is it from last time? Oh no, I'm still here, I'm lowering it. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Good feedback. Anybody else? No, Jane, thank you for being here all the way from Hawaii. Here she goes. Okay, I'm gonna close this. I'll switch to, I'll get ready for statistics next. Give me a moment here. Um, So you may recall a few meetings ago, I was 
talking about statistics and I was like, you know, I used to do all these stats and I would report on them at every month, at every month, every meeting. Um, I would report on that month's stats. Um, and then I got to a point where I was doing quarterly reports. I was putting a lot of effort into quarterly reports and I have these annual kind of heat maps I was doing. And with the pandemic and everything with my own schedule, I put a pause on that and was really just sharing major highlights. So I did go through and I filled in my heat map for um, all of this last fiscal year that just ended in June and the one before that as well. And then, uh, and I have, um, a few graphs. I haven't done the management reports like I had before those quarterly reports that I do want to do. So I have, um, let, me, let me share this. So this is going to look like uh, too much. I just want you to like just see the color. <laughs> One second here. <laughs> and it's going to look really small. Um, so those of you that have been on the board for a while, you'll kind of recognize this format, I think. So I want you to know, just for the purposes of this meeting, like each month and each thing that we're tracking has a number associated with it, very precise, but I'm not going to go into all that detail right now. There's some really interesting trends that are appearing and getting into the detail. So I'm going to flip over to these graphs. Um, can you see this all right? So, so for total checkouts, so if a person who has a library card that's home library is set as Sherwood and they check out, um, or excuse me, doesn't matter where their home library is set. If they, if they come to Sherwood Public Library and they check out materials, physical materials, those numbers go into here. If they're a Sherwood patron and they check out eBooks, wherever they are, then those numbers go into these. So total is everything. So this is this last fiscal year that just ended. The um, This darker blue bar um, is total checkouts this year. And then total checkouts last year, you can see, okay, here's when the pandemic hits, right? And, uh, and it bottoms out. But it didn't bottom out to zero. It bottomed out to... Like, um, you know, the 5,000 to 9,000 range going through June of this year. Um, so that irks me, June of 2020. With me so far? Does that make sense? Okay, so then if we just talk about OverDrive, the digital, the ebooks, and the downloadable audiobooks, now notice, um, actually, I'm going to go up again. Notice this chart, it goes up to 40,000 at the top. Now we're kind of zooming in, right? So now our top is just 10,000. So we can look at the, just the piece that's OverDrive. So in this case, the green bar is this fiscal year that just ended. And uh, you can see we got almost up to 9,000 um, a year after the pandemic. When um, the yellow the yellow line was last fiscal year, so March 2020, when the pandemic was you know midway through that month, it started, and uh, ebooks shot up and then just kept shooting up, and that's where Melanie, I think you were asking about um, ebooks being higher. So for a little while we were higher, and then what's happened in July in August of this year so far is it's, I don't have that data in here, so it's new fiscal year, but it's um, um, it's staying comparable. It's in the 8,000 range for ebooks. And then I want to, I'm going to pop back over to the, just the numbers for a moment. So like if we look this row is probably too small to see, but this is this has changed from pre-pandemic. So I don't usually on on this um, document. I don't usually include three years of data. I usually just have the current year and the previous year. But I decided to go ahead and put the fiscal year eighteen nineteen because that was a solid whole year pre-pandemic, and so you can see um, what's the percentage change from this year's total checkout to that pre-pandemic year. And like July 2020, when we were 
you know, 60, 59% below pre-pandemic levels, and then it's getting to half and kind of a third. And, and now um, in June, it was at 14% pre-pandemic levels for total checkouts. July, what's not on here, but the next report, July is at 12%. And August, just last month, was at 2%, negative 2%, negative 12%. So we're almost back to pre-pandemic levels if that you know, if that holds. Um, but what's different is that ebooks make up a greater percentage of the pie than previously. So ebooks, um, ebooks, make sure I say the right thing. Like this last fiscal year, you can see it's been right around the 8,000, almost 9,000 in some cases mark. The previous year, um, we we're right around the 5,000 mark. And then when the pandemic started, we shot up to 8,000 just really quickly. And it's holding steady, even though, you know, we're open. So I think that would be an interesting trend to follow as we are open and people feel safer coming out. And as the pandemic starts to eventually fade away, will ebook usage still stay? stay really high it would be a bigger piece of the pie so i'll go back over to my graphs here um and then readers advisory and reference so when staff are answering questions i don't know if there's i think it's it's unpredictable sometimes when we're going to get lots of questions and then we don't but the so the blue line is this fiscal year that just ended and then the orange line is last year. So we got actually this big spike that I don't really know why right before the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, we were still answering questions, but not as many. I mean, we were only doing virtual services there for a while. Um, but then as it wrapped around to the current year, you know, they started to go up. And then we're kind of, we missed that big spike, whatever that was. Or it's still, that line is never quite predictable. And then, oh, I think I meant somehow this got out of order. Sorry. Pretend we we're still talking about checkouts. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. So checkouts. So we were talking about eBooks. Here's just looking at physical checkouts, blue line, this last fiscal year that just ended and, uh, you know, going gradually going up again and then the orange line the previous fiscal year again in march it just bottomed out and we were closed for a while but you can see june is when we started curbside and then by the time it wraps around if you think of it as you know here curbside was helping we didn't open to public some of you came to that open um what do we call it not open house um like a dress rehearsal for being open again that was in april 2021 and then we opened our doors in may and expanded ours in june so. all right and then the overlay this is all of those checkout stats the physical is still the blue line the orange line is the previous year and then the the digital i already talked about those but you know, when you look at this again, if you want to, you can, you can examine that more. Um, and then new library accounts. So new library cards this last fiscal year, we were doing some during, during curbside only, but not a ton. And people could do e-access cards themselves to get um, e-books. And we would help with that on the phone as needed or email and then last fiscal year um you can see it got really low during the the brief onset of the pandemic I think this is so those are those are the themes i'm pulling out so far um programming you know we have some really strong numbers with programming and so on i, I uh, i'll do some more presentations about that or, or graphs about that when i do my management report but it's about that depends, but about a quarter or so of what we used to do. Any questions, comments? We'll go. 
maybe back up to the this one. Okay. I'll stop sharing that then. So um, I think it was useful. It was useful for me to get down to that level of detail. And then something that it prepares me to do is the state, you may remember, has a uh, requirement for all libraries, all public libraries, to do a public library statistics um, uh, report. And that becomes part of the permanent record for for what we keep, it goes to the state and it feeds up to the national level for public library data. So most of the data that I'm collecting also goes into that state report in a different form. Um, so, so I have to do it because it's due at the end of October. <laughs> it's very detailed, I'm impressed. Oh, thank you. Was a, I hold up in my office the, the last few days. <laughs> Those final little numbers in there. Um, let's see, it's going to pop up the agenda again. So, um, Melanie, I can't remember if, if I said this when you were already here. Councillor Browse had let me know that she might not make it. She had another, she had a, a meeting that got scheduled right before this one. She thought maybe she'd make it, but she, she also said, sorry if I can't. So, um, looks like. Looks like she won't be here. Okay. Do we have any other business that we need to address? None that I know of. All right. Well, without Councilwoman Browse to give us the City Council update, I don't think we have anything else. Is that correct? Yes, she didn't give me any of those. Let me just, I'll just pop over to my email and see if she emailed while I was talking. Okay. And, uh, uh, but I don't think so. I haven't seen anything. Nope. Nope. All right. No counselor updates. And then I believe our next meeting is October 20th. Is that correct? Let's see, October 20th, yes, third Wednesday, 6.30 to 8 p.m. on Teams. Okay. And I am going to need to leave early that day because I have, my daughter has a performance, a very important performance that evening <laughs> that I need to attend. Um, Randy, would you be available as the vice chair to take over? I can do that. Okay, fantastic. All right. Then I think we can adjourn the meeting. Is that correct, Adrian? Yes, look at that. Okay. Early. Yeah. Uh, and adjourn the meeting then at 7.41. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Melanie. Yeah. Nice job being chair. Yeah. Good to see everybody. Have a good Thank evening. You. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Oh my goodness, Mark, are you there? Oh man.